Prabhupada initiated uh, many different countries at this particular time. Uh, London one day, uh, G Germany one day, France one day, and Holland another day. So we were from Amsterdam, we were from Holland. And so um, we all came there. Prabhupada was very happy that we all came from Holland. So um, it was a, a room full of devotees. I'd I'd never really been in much bigger association than my family, which was about eight of us. And then again, when I came in contact with the devotees, there was probably about eight of us. And so I wasn't used to big crowds, you know. So when I went to get my name from Srila Prabhupada, um, he said, your name is Sarabi Devi Dasi the name of the transcendental cow, the giver of abundance of milk. And he must have seen I was a little bit uncomfortable in the whole situation with all the people. And he said, don't be afraid. He said, if you follow this process, you'll go back home, back to God at the end of your life. And so that was pretty amazing for me. And I could feel the love from Srila Prabhupada. He was such a, a beautiful, caring person. I got initiated at Rathiatra in 1972. And when we got back to Vedanta Manor in 1973, somebody informed us that we were supposed to offer Guru Dakshin. And gradually I tried to figure out what they meant. What was, it? What was Guru Dakshin? And it became clear that for Guru Dakshin, one should go uh, around and beg for some Dakshin, some gift for the spiritual master. So I became very concerned because I thought in Lechmore Heath, if the devotees go around begging from door to door, it's not going to look very good and it may not shed this movement in a very nice light. So I became very concerned about how to actually give some Guru Dakshin to Srila Prabhupada. So I asked Shruti Kirti, who was Prabhupada's secretary, his servant, what to do. And he suggested, well, why don't you write a letter to Srila Prabhupada? So after a lot of soul searching, I finally worked out the words. I was sitting on the windowsill by the, win uh, by the window in Prabhupada's balcony. And I wrote this letter to Srila Prabhupada as best I could, expressing my anxiety and my gratefulness to him for accepting me as his disciple. I gave the letter to Shruti Kirti, and he took it in in due course of his service to Srila Prabhupada. And I heard nothing more of it. But then I asked him later, did Prabhupada say anything when he read the letter? And Shruti Kirti looked at me a little strangely, and he said, <laughs> He said, his humility is his good qualification. So from that I could understand that Prabhupada, he could recognize even that I was a completely useless person. I couldn't even get a gift of Guru Dakshin for him. But somehow Prabhupada could take some teeny, insignificant quality and make it into something as an offering to him and Krishna. And that was something, a very personal thing that I don't normally tell people. Hare Krishna. But I thought because it demonstrates Prabhupada's wonderful qualities, it should be said. In Banaras also there are three important questions. First, I asked Srila Prabhupada about the Guru Dakshina. So he said it's just a formality. It shows that you have become the servant of your guru. You just go one door to two door and 
beg with your relatives, whatever you can get. Second question was, uh, how can I wear tilak? I am a student. My teachers will laugh at me, my colleagues. The so Prabhupada said, uh, you are the soldier of Krishna. As soon as when a soldier, he fights gallantly, bravely in the battlefield, government gives him gallantry award. In India, we have Param Viri Chakra, Maha Viri Chakra medals. So on behalf of Krishna, if you face criticism and laughing of your friends, Krishna will be more pleased. So don't worry. Then third question was, how can I shave off my hair? Prabhupada replied, it's a Vedic custom to make Brahman first and then give initiation. So you shave once and then you can give a short hair. But still I was not very certain, so that landlord, who is the owner of our Calcutta temple, Mr. Lalit Mohan Singh Ray, now he's no more, Prabhupada is staying in his house, he came. He said, today is a very auspicious day of Lord Nityananda's appearance, Nityan Triyodashi. So as soon as I heard, I said, okay, I'm taking initiation. Prabhupada said, okay, go, take bath, shave off your hair, bring a new dhoti. So in midday, he gave me initiation without any fire sacrifice, I was the only one person in his temple. Then Prabhupada uh, wanted me to arrange his lecture in BHU, which we couldn't do because of uh, shortage of time. He had to leave to Gorakhpur. Then he asked me, do you have any questions? Next day, I was there and our Jadubar Prabhu, John, he was also there. So I asked uh, Prabhupada, what should be our relationship with Krishna? Is it neutral, servitude, friendship, conjugal? So he said, common platform is neutrality. You begin your chanting or service from that level, and then you go on at making advancement. But he said, don't jump. Just chant Hare Krishna, and all your doubts will be cleared up. We were able to go to the botanical gardens in Melbourne. Now, the botanical gardens there are very beautiful. Uh, the ladies were in the back and the very intelligent ones would pick up the leaves as Srila Prabhupada stood on the leaves. But one devotee, Gopal Dasi, said, let's go to the front. We can't really hear what Pra Prabhupada's saying, so let's run to the front. So we did. And um, Srila Prabhupada stopped at a, a tree and he took a leaf from the tree and crumpled it up and, and smelt it and said, oh, what kind of tree is this? And the devotee said, Srila Prabhupada, it's a camphor tree. And Srila Prabhupada said, oh, that's Radharani's favorite fragrance. And then one of the devotees, his name is Chittahari Das, said to him, Prabhupada, we're always uh, talking about living in Vaikuntha, but I find that I'm always in anxiety. So can you please explain that? And Srila Prabhupada said, yes, to be in a living body means we're always in anxiety, but we have a choice. We can either be in material anxiety or spiritual anxiety. He said, yes, Prabhupada, when I'm distributing books or trying to cook an offering, I'm in so much anxiety. I, I thought maybe I wasn't a very good devotee because of that. And Prabhupada said, no, if you're not in anxiety, you are zombie, zombie. You are the walking dead. But, you know, you, you are in anxiety and it's the right kind of anxiety. So that's wonderful. I believe it was around 1972, I'm not sure, 72, 73. I learned about video recording uh, from, I was, my job or service was to work with the media, colleges. Uh, I, I came to New York City uh, on the behest of Rupanuka Prabhu, who wanted me to get into booking engagements in colleges and schools, working with the media, public relations. 
So I learned about cable TV, and I thought, okay, that would be a fantastic thing. We could get on cable TV. So I got a very generous uh, contribution from my mother. She was uh, she bought a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck and uh, equipment. And so the first thing is I began, Prabhupada arrived shortly after that, and I videoed Srila Prabhupada giving class. And after doing the video, I went to Prabhupada's room sometime in the morning and lugged a big television monitor and set it down and brought all the equipment and set it down. Prabhupada came, sat at his desk there in New York and began watching himself on TV. I mean, this is the same morning it was recorded and the, he's, he's seeing himself. And what really struck me was when, towards the end of the, the video, uh, Srila Prabhupada had taken over the, the kirtan and was leading the kirtan himself. So here is Srila Prabhupada. He's sitting there watching himself leading the kirtan. And he's, you can see he's watching, and he begins to clap along with the kirtan. And I, I got this sense that he was not like you or me who would be thinking, oh, that's me. <laughs> he was hearing the kirtan. And he was appreciating the kirtan. And he was, he was not in that sense of, of looking at himself. He was in the sense of just hearing the kirtan and participating in the kirtan. And I, 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 that was very moving to me. My sense was that Srila Prabhupada really saw Krishna in his holy name. And he really got to experience Krishna in a way that uh, just pulled him in and he, he, he could appreciate Krishna's holy name in ways that, you know, we might be looking more at the video and the quality and the, the, you know, all of that, but he was just the holy name. This is a story that doesn't directly involve me, but it shows me, I was there, was present, it shows me how Prabhupada's um, you know, desire to encourage the devotees when the devotees needed encouragement. And once again, his, you know, great attention to detail and his focus on the deities. And it was during a Bhagavatam class and Narayani uh, Mataji was the head pujari for Radha Govinda. And Srila Prabhupada during the class, he said, oh, who has dressed Radha Govinda? And at that stage, Narayani was extremely shy and she didn't want to put a hand up. And again Prabhupada said, who has dressed Radha Govinda? And all the devotees are turning to her and eventually she very shyly put up a hand and Srila Prabhupada gave her this beautiful smile and said, thank you very much. It was such a lovely, you know, um, kindness and, and compassion and she was very excited about that because she was a very devoted pujari for Radha Govinda. And, um, at that stage, uh, I was still a Bhaktin, and they really needed a pujari for Jagannath Balaram Subhadra. So Gaga Muni Maharaj wrote to Srila Prabhupada and said, we have one Australian devotee here. Um, would you be able to give her, or would you kindly agree to give her first and second initiation? I never saw the letter, but this is what Gaga Muni Ma Maharaj had told me. So Prabhupada agreed. And then I traveled back to Vrindavan. This stage now, it's um, 1974. So um, this was Janmashtami, 1974 in Vrindavan. And Srila Prabhupada uh, gave me first and second initiation together. And it was uh, an amazing ceremony. And after the uh, fire jagya, those who were receiving the Gayatri lined up to go into Srila Prabhupada's room. So, at that stage, we would just go in by ourselves. So there was Srila Prabhupada and myself. And Vishalini, who was a dear God sister of mine, she had given me a couple of instructions. I said to her, what should I do when I go in and see Prabhupada? She said, well, Prabhupada really likes it if you smile. So give Prabhupada a really big smile. And she'd also very kindly lent me a very glamorous 
um, forest green sari full of sequins. And I was used to wearing, you know, very humble cloth, life member leftovers or whatever, you know. And so she dressed me up in this thing. And because it was forest green, she decided she'd stick leaves. I thought I'd look really good with bits of trees stuck in my head. So I presented this very interesting <laughs> spectacle, I'm sure. And I went into Srila Prabhupada's room and I bowed down and s sat up and fixed this really broad grin on my face. Biggest smile I could muster with bits of trees hanging out. And Srila Prabhupada, in that situation, he displayed his great interest for, his, for Prabhupada's daughters, for his female disciples. And he said to me, oh, you are from Calcutta. And I went, yes, Sri the Prabhupada, I'm from Calcutta Temple. And he said, do any men go upstairs into the women's quarters? Now, for anyone who doesn't know the geography of or the layout of Calcutta Temple, um, let me explain that the women at that stage lived upstairs in, a, in the roof room. And we would have to go down the stairs and we would have to actually go through the men's bathroom to get to the temple. So it wasn't congenial, you know, we'd all gather before Mongolati, bang on the door, hurry ball, Nightingale's coming through, and then we'd have to barge through hoping we wouldn't get contaminated by bath water because the brahmacharis and whatever still kept on bathing. So Prabhupada was aware that it wasn't congenial. Um, and he asked that question, and I said, no, Sri the Prabhupada, they only come up to get their suitcases. And Prabhupada was satisfied with that because their suitcases were stored on the room. Yeah, sorry, on the roof. And, um, and then Prabhupada called me over and I sat right next to Srila Prabhupada, literally an inch, from, an inch from him. And he held out his lotus palms and showed me how to chant the Gayatri. And by a miracle, I was able to pronounce the Sanskrit properly. He didn't correct me. And, you know, I promised him that I'd follow the four regulative principles always. And that was a wonderful experience of Prabhupada's great concern. The next big event was Srila Prabhupada giving the Sunday Feast Lecture. Now, Prabhupada had always given the morning classes. That's something amazing about Prabhupada. Wherever he was, that's how most of the devotees who joined after the GBC was formed in 1972 or three. Most devotees didn't speak to Prabhupada directly, they heard Prabhupada through class. But this class, he opened up the floor for questions and answers at the end. This was a Sunday feast lecture. Um, some Christians in the audience uh, raised their hand and Prabhupada had to batter back and forth with them about, you know, how Jesus Christ said this, <laughs> thou shalt not kill, why do you kill, you know, because they're trying to say Jesus is the only way, and Prabhupada was saying, well, then be a good Christian and be vegetarian, because you shouldn't kill animals in, in the name of Christ. And then uh, I had a question, because I knew that Prabhupada didn't do questions that often, you know, because devotees would ask questions, I don't know what happened, but he was, generally he would just say, thank you very much at the end of the lecture. So I just threw my hand up, said, Sri the Prabhupada. And uh, he looked at me and, and then I thought, oh my God, I have to have a question. I just knew that it was a great chance to ask one. So I just blurted out the first thing that came to the top of my head. Sri the Prabhupada, how can I perfect my devotional service? And he thought for a moment, he said, just chant Hare Krishna and everything else will come. It's very simple. And at the time, I thought, that's kind of a stupid question because I didn't really think it out. And the answer he gave me is just what he tells everybody, just chant Hare Krishna, he says that all the time. But as the years have gone by, I realized that it was a good question and that it was a perfect answer. And that the, it was very, very important actually in my life to understand that, to always keep on chanting Hare Krishna no matter what ups and downs you have, or whatever happens, everything else will come. It was actually a very deep philosophical point that he made and that it's very simple. So that was Srila Prabhupada in Atlanta, 1975. 
And as we were walking through the village of Lechmore Heath, Prabhupada, uh, he was talking about how there are so many luminaries in this world, but they can't give any real light, just like the glowworms. And then Prabhupada looked me right in the eye and said, uh, oh, one thing he said before that, he said, so even the Maharishi, he knows that if anyone is serious, he has to send them to us. His servant, Aravinda, he has also come to us. So then Prabhupada, he said, uh, looking me right in the eye, which was a real experience, uh, he said, what is the use of so many stars when with one moon you can light up the whole night? And later I realized more and more, although at the time I realized that Prabhupada was actually looking right through me and I was completely transparent to Srila Prabhupada. But I realized afterwards not only the fact that Prabhupada actually was that moon who was lighting up the night, but Prabhupada wanted all of us to become moons and not just stars. So that was a very special time. In a quiet moment in his room, I went in there alone because uh, I wanted to speak to him privately. And I did ask him, you know, uh, uh, that it seems that some of your disciples, they're not following properly. And in the scriptures, it's stated that if we want to, we should really serve by being the servant of the servants mentioned in the Padma Purana. But by doing that, being the servant of the servant, then how can we get confidence in our elder, senior God brothers if they're not following or chanting or whatever? And he went very quiet and he looked at me. First of all, I had a tape recorder and the tape recorder was goofing up left, right, and center. But Krishna wouldn't allow it to be recorded. <laughs> and uh, although I could get bits and pieces of it later, but it, it just goofed up. But in any case, he looked at me. And when he looked at me, because it was, in, in effect, it was a bit of a complaint, which I felt very ashamed to come at that time. I felt very ashamed to even approach him with such a question. And he looked at me, and it went right through me, his look. It penetrated me like a, like a train going through a tunnel, as if he could see my entire history. I, I, I'd put my foot in it, but I also felt the ramifications of that question. And then, obviously, it was an awkward question. But he did answer, eventually. And then he told me, he said, so you are following? I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. And then he said, you follow Krishna. Even I may be, but you follow Krishna, then you have no problems. And then he got a little, you know, awkward, and he had to go to the bathroom to relieve himself, and he came back. But then I, I also felt really bad. <laughs> you know, <it> was, <laughs> I, I regretted it. Many Prabhupada disciples came down uh, to Bhuvaneshwar, but there wasn't much to see. You know, it's just Prabhupada had laid the cornerstone for the future temple. And uh, they had gone to Puri, and Srila Prabhupada had, um, had been negotiating with the Pandas of Jagannath Puri Temple that uh, I want to meet with you, let's meet, let's talk, and uh, I want all of my disciples and international disciples from all over the world to be able to take darshan of Lord Jagannath. He's not the, the Lord of Puri, he's the Lord of the universe. So he wanted to do that. So the, the appointment was made, the site was chosen. It was a slight promontory with one tree for shade, just right on the beach, right off the beach, very near Puri. And there were probably 20 uh, devotees, men and women, mixed in audience, in entourage. And Srila Prabhupada was sitting, being fanned and chamra, and he would, you know, chant in japa for a little while, then maybe he'll speak 
few words and then we'd chant Japa again. And this went on and on for about an hour and a half and we were sitting there, it was n noticeable, we were watching him visibly get angry, very angry. So the Pandas from Puri Temple had stood up Srila Prabhupada, they had stood him up, they had no show, they did not show up. And Srila Prabhupada was quite angry, he, okay, he was furious, he went nuclear. Um, and that is when he made the famous statement that if the Pandas do not change this, this Maya attitude, um, then Lord Jagannath himself will get up and walk to and stay at our ISKCON temple. So some devotees assumed that meant the temple in Bhuvaneshwar. And now, then later, later years, ISKCON actually bought land uh, near Puri and they plan to build a temple. So we don't know which temple the Lord Jagannath w w will walk to when it, when it happens, if it happens. But I'm told repeatedly that the Pandas of Puri are very much afraid of this, pr this prediction by a pure devotee of Lord Krishna. Very much afraid to this day. Sugu Kripa started a kirtan. And the conch shell blew, and the Artik started. And after the ghee lamp was offered, it was, I took it, and for some un, you know, knowing, knowing the reason, I went around to all the devotees first and to Srila Prabhupada last. Srila Prabhupada didn't seem disturbed. He was absorbed in chanting the holy name. Guru Kripa was leading. It was very lively, very energetic, lots of dancing. And he was sitting on the Vyasa san we had located there. And he simply took his hands and put him to his head and folded his hands like in appreciation for you know, me offering that to him. So the con party continued and after the, the ghee lamp, the water was offered to the Gornitai deities we had there. And I, after it was offered to the deities, I took the the Pajari handed me the water, and I followed suit as what I had previously done. I went to all the devotees first, and then I went up to Srila Prabhupada last and sprinkled water on his head in a very, very respectfully. And he bowed his head, um, giving me like his, he appreciated how I had offered him the, the water. So the, the kirtan continued, devotees were dancing, and you know, then the handkerchief, and then the flowers, and the pajari offered me the flowers. I went through all the devotees first, and then I went to Srila Prabhupada last, and Srila Prabhupada bent down and smelled the flowers and gave me a big smile. So, I had been there for two, about two weeks, and I had been through this procedure previously, and I'd done it properly, and I don't know why I acted like I did in Srila Prabhupada's presence. It wasn't some, I, it was totally unintentional. Um, and I remember thinking in my mind, like when you take a meal, you save the dessert for last. So I was thinking that out of respect for Srila Prabhupada, he's, he's the best, I will give it to him last. And the quality of Srila Prabhupada I get from this is his utmost humility. He wasn't thinking he's, you know, you know, such a big devotee, and why are you giving it to all 
the other devotees first and me last. There, there was, it was actually, there was no struggle in his face, like he, had be, he was disturbed or upset with me. Um, and he did it three times. And usually if you do something like that three times, you know someone would be a little upset with you. But he didn't say anything to anybody. Um, of course, afterwards people did say, other people said things to me, but Srila Prabhupada, I never heard, said anything to anybody else. And so I, um, now, many, you know, 40 years later, here I am in Mayapur, and I'm a senior Prabhupada disciple, and sometimes the ghee lamp comes around, and, you know, I remember that, and I don't, and, and I, it, 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 if it doesn't come to me b before someone doing a person, I'll, remember how Srila Prabhupada acted and struggle with my mind to um, counteract the, the pride that I have of thinking that I'm senior and um, I, I deserve the respect and the honor and the, um, you know, the, the first touch of the gilam, so to speak, like that. We used to go from Germany to France to see Srila Prabhupada. Whenever Prabhupada came somewhere in Europe, most of the temples would go there. So we went to France and we stayed in the very small temple they had in the beginning where Hari Vilas was the temple president and they had some incense business. It wasn't very big at all. I think the temple room was like a garage really. And, um, Anyway, in those days, we didn't sit all separate. The men and the women, we just sat mixed. And I was kind of the first one into the room, so I thought, oh, I'm going to sit up the front. And we had mats on the floor. And in, um, in Germany, at least, we hadn't done the reading of the Shema Bhagavatam with Sanskrit, percent, um, pronouncing the Sanskrit. And then Prabhupada gave the class and he said, and he pronounced the Sanskrit, and then he said that, uh, to the men, the men, you aren't men. And then after some time, I thought, he's going to say women. And I'm sitting right up the front. He's, they're going to give the book to me. And I'm going, oh my God, what am I going to do? And I couldn't get out of it, right? And they gave the book to me. And I felt like crawling under the carpet. I was so embarrassed because I really, really hadn't pronounced Sanskrit that much. Anyway, so I started pronouncing the verse and I couldn't say it hardly at all. But Prabhupada started following with me and, and started, you know, saying it with me. And he was so kind and I was just hopeless. And he said in the end, very good. And I just thought, this man, this beautiful man is just so wonderful. I was so embarrassed, I must have been as red as a beetroot. And he just was so kind to me, you know. So I, you know, from the, all these things, I never can forget them. And this has, things make me love Prabhupada even more when I talk to you about it. So, yeah, Prabhupada was wonderful. He was always, always I found he was such a caring person and he was always concerned about us, that we were warm, that we were, had enough milk, you know, whatever. That was Prabhupada. Another time on a morning walk in London, I'd been a little puzzled because when I joined the temple, I joined, or I thought I joined, with a friend of mine who was very eager. Uh, you know, he seemed even more enthusiastic than me to join the temple but I wound up moving in and he didn't. So I asked Prabhupada, uh, why is it that when two people come to Krishna consciousness, that one person takes it up and the other one doesn't? And Prabhupada's reply was very interesting. He said, uh, when someone is materially fatigued, he can take up Krishna consciousness. And then he said, so by the association of devotees, we become materially fatigued. 
So it was a very good experience that just cleared all my doubts about that. Prabhupada's answer was so perfect. Another example I wanted to talk about to illustrate Prabhupada's concern for his and love for his female disciples was um, in Maipur, one incident had occurred where I was picking flowers in um, the field that was just in front of the Lotus Building. And Prabhupada was up on the balcony and he said to his servant, who, who I think it was Hari Sori, who later related to me, he said every step, every, rather every flower she picks is a step towards Krishna. So it was very wonderful Prabhupada's observ observation. I was living in New York for the first five years, more or less, of my devotional life. And I, at one point, I became responsible for fundraising for ISKCON food relief. So I began to develop a, a strategy to try to raise money from corporations. And I thought, well, they wouldn't relate to Krishna. So I came up with this idea, I'll, I'll, I'll make a letterhead that just says ISKCON on it. And I actually rented an address on 51st Street in Manhattan. So I put, and a telephone number. So I put the address of such a da 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 da, West, uh, East 51st First Street, New York, New York Center. And I attempt, I made some letter appointments and I, so I didn't actually raise any money. So Srila Prabhupada visited New York a few months later. And I was uh, in, in my office and I think it was Brahmananda came up the stairs and said, Srila Prabhupada wants to see you. And he didn't really, he said he's, he's, he didn't really explain it to me as I remember. So I, but I, I, I sensed that there was something going on. So I went down and that, that letterhead was on, <laughs> was on Prabhupada's table. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, uh, you have done this? And I said, yes. <laughs> so where is International Society for Krishna Consciousness? Where is Founder Acharya? And I said, I, I don't know if I even tried to explain. <laughs> All I remember is saying, so you won't do this again? <laughs> and, and so, yes, I, uh, I've never done it again, and I've always told people about it because it was, you know, a, a lesson about the importance of always associating ISKCON with its full name, International Society for Christian Consciousness. Of course, we, we do use ISKCON as it is, but when we have, wherever practical and possible, we should recognize Srila Prabhupada as the founder of Charya. So that was, a, that was a, a good lesson. So every day Srila Prabhupada gave class and in the morning. And Srila Prabhupada, I remember little bits and pieces from the classes. Uh, one was about how he said that we were all in the womb at one time. If we were advanced, then we had a vision of Krishna and that we promised Krishna that once we get out of this horrible situation, we're going to surrender our lives. But then, he's, then you're born and then there's a, a forgetfulness because everybody's all, all giving you attention and, you know, nice facility, you know. so. The, that you forget your promise that you, you're going to go give yourself, you know, now it's nice, you, know, you, for, you forget the misery. So Prabhupada was pointing out how the, you know, when they're in a miserable condition in the material world, it can be good for our spiritual life, not always enjoying all the time. And then he said uh, about parenthood, he said if the father is not responsible, then he should be kicked. And I thought that was a pretty heavy thing to say, you know, that he was trying to sh point out that the parent, being a father, is, you know, he would always say that it's best if you stay brahmachari, but then he said if you do get married, then you can't be 
all halfway about that. You have to be a very responsible father and be ready to take your, not only take your kids back to Godhead through spiritual life, but also take care of them, all their, all their needs in life. I remember Prabhupada coming back from the morning walk and he was coming in and he would go up the stairs and it was just silent. So I thought, oh, I've got to make a kirtan, it can't be just silent like this. So I started singing Namo Vishnu Padaya and Prabhupada went up the stairs and he turned around and he looked down at me and he went like this. So for me, Prabhupada always was noticing every little thing and he just, he, he cared for us that any little thing that we did for him, he acknowledged it, that, that it was special to him, that we were taking that care to do something for him. And you, you find, you don't find people like that, that they really take notice. And Prabhupada took notice of every little thing, even though just starting a kirtan, that he noticed it. And yeah, so I always feel dearly like Prabhupada's my father because of the way he always treated us. Yes. We'd arrange for a, a, a yellow Mercedes saloon car for, for Prabhupada to be waiting outside. And the flower petals were coming out, and Prabhupada looked regal. He looked like an emperor. And Johannesburg is more relaxed than Natal, where racism is a bit more rife. So this South African, uh, South African police officer who was standing outside on the uh, forecourt there on the arrivals. He saw Srila Prabhupada and he saw the car, so he opened the door for Srila Prabhupada and he saluted Srila Prabhupada. And I was really taken back when I saw that. I thought, wow, only this could happen in a Johannesburg scenario. And that guy got blessed. He did some service. He was obviously an Afrikaner, you know, from the regime, but he, he knew something special was coming down. Shri Prabhupada, about for Hindi translation, we were consulting to him. And he was, why you're translating like this? I didn't do. I said, no, Shri Prabhupada, <laughs> you have done like that. Well, okay, read. And Prabhupada said, you, I want to train you up. Stay with me for a few months. So with cool head, I can sit down with you. He heard my translation, and he approved those translations. And then again, there were about uh, 200 Indians from uh, Liverpool. So Prabhupada came in back to the outside and he said, there's so many Indians. I was standing by his side, he said, okay, speak in Hindi. And I was completely scared, my legs were trembling. So I read the original shloka as for, uh, from chapter 13, Shetragya Maam Vidhi Sarva Kshetre Subharata. Then I stopped. Prabhupada said, no, tell the translation word meaning. Again I stopped. Say, you are not going to stop as long as I say you to stop. <laughs> so I was for 20 minutes in the purport. And that guru is the via media. That was the main position. Shri Prabhupada quoted in English as well. Just like glass. Glass doesn't see. Through glass we are seeing. So through spiritual master we are serving Krishna. So in Nairobi, about, it was either 76 or 77. I think 76. Prabhupada had gone on a morning walk and we went to this beautiful park in the early morning and the birds were singing, the sun was shining. It was an incredibly transcendental atmosphere with the birds in the trees. And we went onto this bandstand in the middle of the park. There was nobody else around. And something very unusual happened because usually we would expect that Prabhupada would say something to us. But this time he said, so talk among yourselves. Actually, he said, discuss among yourselves. So we all kind of wondered, what on earth do we say? Who do we say? You know, who do we say anything to? And um, I remember Chayavana Swami, he uh, came up with the idea, he said, Aham Saravasya Prabhava, that Krishna is the source of all the material and spiritual worlds. And Prabhupada stopped him. He said, forget scripture. 
What is the argument? And we're trying to understand what he meant. Of course, it was always very interesting on morning walks because we'd always learn so much. So then Prabhupada explained something which stuck with me for all these years. Prabhupada explained that when someone is asleep, automatically some salty water comes from the body, maybe a little one or two ounces of salty water from our bodies. But then from Krishna's body, his body is so great, he can produce a whole ocean of salty water. So this was quite a revelation. And I remember Harry Kesh was with us, who would usually take the devil's advocate role and argue with Prabhupada, which mostly we found quite shocking. But he said, but first you have to drink water before you can perspire. And so Prabhupada, he looked to one Dr. Shah who was there and said, is that right? And Dr. Shah said, no. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, just see. <laughs> and then Prabhupada went on to explain, so just like water is coming from the body, similarly from our bodies we also produce some liquids and some gases and some solids. So in the same way, the gases, liquids and solids, they're all coming from Krishna's body. So from this it became very clear, Prabhupada wanted us to have very practical, reasonable arguments that we could convince everyone that not only the living beings come from the living beings, but also that matter comes from the living being. I thought it was such a fantastic argument, and I still use that in schools to school children today. Hare Krishna. Another example of Prabhupada's kindness and tolerance was this uh, one time I was able to give, take up Sri Prabhupada's plate. Um, this was usually Vrindavan Biharini's um, good fortune. This one time she said, uh, Krishna Rupa, why don't you take this up for Prabhupada? And his evening plate was comprised of a cup of hot milk, a guava with some, you know, spices. But this day she had a bowl of cream. I didn't know for sure what it was, so I said to her, oh, what's that? And she said, oh, that's Shah. And I was a little puffed up still am puffed up, but I didn't want to ask her. I didn't want to reveal my ignorance. What Shah in Bangla? So at that stage in life, um, or rather in ISKCON, Prabhupada, we were told, did not like us to use the words, I think. We either knew or we didn't know. So this was always very uppermost in our minds, not to speculate. So, of course, I went up to Prabhupada's room in Mayapur, there are a number of sannyasis also talking to Srila Prabhupada. I went in, put the plate on Prabhupada's desk, offered my obeisances, and just as I was putting my head up, Srila Prabhupada said to me, pointing to the bowl of shah, what is that? And then my immediate reaction was to say, I think, and as soon as I said those words, I blushed bright red, thinking, oh no, I said, I think directly to Srila Prabhupada. I think it's cream, Srila Prabhupada, and kind of mentally hitting myself on the head with a shoe. And as re Prabhupada didn't say anything, he was very tolerant. He didn't say, what do you mean you think? You know or you don't know? He didn't say, oh, thank you. And I left the room. And that was in 1975. So, um, since then, and we're now 2016, I have learned that lesson that if you don't know something, just ask. And I've used that in my professional career and also in my devotional career. If you don't know, just ask. No matter how stupid it seems, just ask. <laughs> that was a very good lesson. After the class, Prabhupada came around, went to the front of the building to get picked up and go to the hotel. And I went around the back. And I buzzed around in a circle, and then uh, <laughs> we were out in front of the temple, and the car wasn't there. The devotee, who was, whoever was supposed to pick Prabhupada up, got caught in traffic, in Chicago traffic, you can imagine. So he was stuck somewhere. And this, we didn't have cell phones, so nobody knew where he was. So it was July, and it was, it was uh, you know, 9 o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden, uh, the whole operation comes to a halt because the car's not there to pick up Prabhupada. 
So Tamal Krishna Goswami standing there, and he had nothing to do with any of these arrangements. First of all, he wasn't the temple president, the GBC, or neither was it his job to arrange for the car. But guess who Shri Prabhupada go goes to? It's Tamal Krishna Goswami. So then I could see that Prabhupada seemed to hold him responsible for everything. <laughs> and Prabhupada looked at Goswami and said, so, where is the car? And Tamal Krishna Maharaj immediately goes into action. He, he sent somebody to get a van from the back, and then he, they went running back there in Janardhan, and then they said that, oh, well, the, the, the bus has got the van blocked in, so then he sent Dravanaksha to move the bus so that Janardhan could bring the van around. And this is like, this got into me like 20, 25 minutes. It wasn't, it was getting hot. And Prabhupada was also, but Prabhupada actually was, I, I've seen pictures of this incident because I, I got to be in picture of Prabhupada because of this on page 178, 1996, Vyasa Puja. There's a photo of this incident and Prabhupada would look very transcendental. He, he was a little disturbed, but he just seemed to go into his chanting and the devotees were trying to protect him from the sun, so they put a, a chutter, a Harinam chutter, and built it like a little tent, you know, or, or like a pot bill over his head. And then finally, the, the driver of the car pulls up, and you could tell on his face that he knew he was really late. And this, the, every, but Prabhupada wasn't too disturbed, you know. He, he was disturbed enough to say, where's the car? But then he just got in and went, went away. A couple things I learned with Srila Prabhupada on the thing with the car in Chicago was that he gets upset about something, but he doesn't hold it. He was always transcendental and absorbed in Krishna's holy names and, and his mission. And he just briefly got upset. Obviously, you know, the car's not there. It's a total space out. And then the other thing was how he put the whole thing on Tamal Krishna Goswami. And I just learned some more about how Prabhupada expected Tamal Krishna Maharaj to carry the ball all the time, you know, that he was, Prabhupada expected him this. He was right-hand man, and that needed to be done, and whatever, it, and he, he was responsible. And then one of the Swamis began to report about some Maharaj who wanted to donate actually a palace or a castle in the, some mountains. And uh, that sannyasi was suggesting, he made a joke, it was only a, a joke, uh, oh, we could put all the women there. <laughs> so then uh, Ramananda had just come, returned from Africa, Kenya, and he told Srila Prabhupada's story that Srila Prabhupada in Kenya is one tribe that has a ritual for a boy to be to become a man, to be initiated into manhood, and therefore he, he would then be able to get married. And this boy would have to go out into the bush or the jungle with only one short spear. Their spear is very short. And he would have to, you know, individually by himself with one little spear, kill a lion. And in that way he would be then a man and, and qualified to marry. And so there were chuckles about that. Um, one of the swamis said, oh, we should make a GBC resolution that any, any brahmachari that wants to get married, he has to first kill a lion. And another swami chuckled, <laughs> too bad we don't have any lions around. No one will get married. And so, you know, I'm just looking around. And then immediately, Srila Prabhupada dropped a bomb and completely changed the mood. He said, that the pure devotee of Krishna is always crying in his heart of hearts for all the poor women and all the poor animals that are being exploited around the world. And so immediately all the, all the swamis, is, you could hear their mouths clamp shut and sh be quiet enough, stop talking. And that lesson taught me something. There was friction at that time between the sannyasis and brahmacharis and householders and women. And, but that taught me that Srila Prabhupada uh, cared equally about everyone. 
and he certainly did not want our women to be mistreated. Uh, um, and he, sh he put the sannyasis into their place. He shut them down, boom, it was like a bomb. I'd never seen anything like it. The next place I shared Srila Prabhupada was um, we went and did some festivals and we were on our way to Sweden and Prabhupada must have come to one of the places, it might have been Denmark, I can't exactly remember. And we put a festival on and Prabhupada came in to talk but he came past the table of food first and, he, and they offered him a drink and it was a, a strawberry drink and Prabhupada said Oh, very nice. Real strawberries? And Himavadi said, no, Srila Prabhupada, not real strawberries. He said, oh, they should be real. <laughs> and that was really nice. He was very concerned, not only just for the devotees, but for the public. He always wanted us to give a good example and have the best for everyone. So I can't remember when this was. It was one of the lectures that Srila Prabhupada gave in New York. So Bali Mardan was, was present and he had put his chudder down on the floor and he'd put the Bhagavatam on the chudder, which I assume he thought, you know, this is nice and respectful. But Srila Prabhupada looked over to him. He said, pick it up. He said, keep it on your lap. So this is another thing that I find myself constantly pointing out to to devotees when they take a book what to speak of on a chudder they just put it on the floor uh, so I, I, I that's another it's it's interesting how these little lessons these little things stick with us and they become part of what we have to pass on to to teach others you know the little little small instructions here and there that form that that big body of, of uh, Vani. So one time in a Srimad Bhagavatam class at Bhaktivedanta Mana, uh, I was sitting near the front of the Vyasasan and Prabhupada was sitting up raised on this Vyasasan. And during the class, one of those wonderful ISKCON microphone stands started doing its thing and gradually slipping down from Prabhupada's mouth. So I looked around and nobody else was getting up to do anything. So I thought, okay, um, let me get up and do something. And I went up and tried to adjust it and tighten it up. And Prabhupada, he just carried on lecturing while I was doing that. And I just went and sat down again. And then after a few moments, it started slipping down again. So I looked at Prabhupada and thought, okay, I've got to try and sort this this time and really tighten it. So I got up again and tried to adjust it and tightened it as much as I could without breaking it and then sat down again quietly. And then after a few moments, it started slipping down again. And Prabhupada looked at me and he shouted at me. He said, fix it today. So unfortunately, the crack in the tiles in the temple room wasn't big enough for me to crawl in between. <laughs> but I was very shocked and disturbed by the experience. And um, I was trying to decide how could I do that? Because I had no resources and no facility and I wasn't the most intelligent person to make it happen. But somehow or other, someone did fix it eventually. But it also made me realize that getting the things done was not just somebody else's responsibility. It was all of us's responsibility. And uh, getting it done and doing it, just doing it, was absolutely important for all of us. We can't wait for somebody else to take care of preaching or anything else. Living in Mayapur and seeing Prabhupada very, very often, and but not being able to go on morning walks with him, 
being in a female body and having a lot of service to do in the mornings, of course, which included cleaning Prabhupada's room. So this one morning, Prabhupada had come back a little early. So he was having breakfast and he would have breakfast in his bedroom on a little small marble table, very low marble table, and he would sit with his back to the, the door between the bedroom and the darshan room. And this particular day, Sruti Rupa had prepared his breakfast. So she had come, delivered the, given Prabhupada the breakfast, and she was still standing there. Now, I hadn't finished cleaning, and I was, you know, cleaning very um, judiciously the way Prabhupada had taught us to clean. So you have, you know, a, a, a cloth with a lot of water, you put it over a couple of tiles, and you put the cloth back in the bucket, wrung it out really tight, then you wiped it. So I was very studiously doing this. And of course, because I wanted to be in the same room as Prabhupada, and Shruti Rupa was there, I got a little slower as I went in my cleaning. And it enabled me to witness this wonderful <coughs> pastime, I guess you could say, wonderful event, where Prabhupada was eating a piece of cucumber. And I had my head down. And then when I heard this noise, I looked up. And Prabhupada had made a, a loud spitting noise, like t. And Sri Rupa said, oh, Srila Prabhupada, it, is something wrong? And Prabhupada picked up the piece of cucumber and he said, have you not tasted this? It's bitter. And she says, oh, Srila Prabhupada, should I, should I taste it before I give to you? And he said, yes. So I thought, ah, oh, that's a very interesting lesson. So of course, I'm still there. And eventually I had to walk, go out of the room because I'd finished cleaning. But it was wonderful to be there with Srila Prabhupada. But then later, and Prabhupada tolerated me once again. He didn't say, what are you doing here? You know, leave. He didn't. He tolerated me. But the next morning, Bhavananda, who was then the co-director of Mayapur with Jayapataka Maharaj, made the announcement, Prabhupada said that you must clean early in the morning. Cleaning late is malecha. So before Mongolati, then everyone would have to clean the temple room. And I felt very guilty because I felt that was my fault because I had been a little slow in getting out of that, that bedroom. So Mayapur, 1976, uh, I went on the morning walk here uh, along the front wall and there is through an exhibit of ISKCON projects all over the world. Uh, I wasn't uh, supposed to go on the morning walk. Of course, everybody was, had to be a GBC or a sannyasi, so I really wanted to get on, so I pulled a shutter over my head and uh, slid into this walk. There's a picture of this in Mahamaya's book uh, called Srila Prabhupada is Coming. The caption says Mayapur 1975, but it was actually 1976. Not just because I'm in it, but Pusta Krishna Swami is the the secretary, Rameshwar is a sannyasi, obviously 1976. One thing, I, the first thing I noticed about the morning walk was how polite everybody was. Srila Prabhupada created an aura, an atmosphere on the morning walk where everybody grew up and was extremely in the mode of goodness. And this was really noticeable because these, these, we were all young devotees and quite often kind of pushy. But with, in Sri Prabhupada's presence, there was complete calm, which is so noticeable. It was like, as, like they say, as thick as soup. You know, it was like a, a, a magic a shield of, of of sattvic energy that, that emanated from Srila Prabhupada. So I could tell that when Prabhupada's there, then he, everybody's consciousness comes up. And when he would stop, and, you know, even though we were all trying to listen, and there was like tw 20 or five devotees, he would stop, everybody would stop. It wouldn't be, you know, like Keystone cops all fumbling over each other. Prabhupada would go, then everybody would go. And there was no, there was no uh, tension or pushing or shoving in this. So that was really noticeable. And we went along the, through these exhibits, and they had, you know, this is really elaborate now. Forty years later, I, I, the international exhibits have really come a long way. But the idea was there. And they had bamboo walls, 
and they had pictures of temples from all over the world, of deities, farm projects, what devotees are doing, you know, with captions like here's New Vrindavan, USA, and it shows the cows and the deities, and here's uh, Gita Nagari, and then it show book distribution, and show the warehouse in LA, and the books, and the BBT offices, and a lot of nice things. Everything was really nice. But Srila Prabhupada really liked the thing that I could see that this is something that meant more to him than anything, just by the way he reacted to it, was the quotes about his books from scholars. And Srila Prabhupada liked everything, all these different pictures of temples all over the world and projects. But he stopped the whole show when he got to the quotes about his books from university professors. And he had them read right there on the spot. And he stopped the whole morning walk for this. And then he said that these should be sent to Indira Gandhi. And then I heard somebody say, yeah, this is a big thing. And Prabhupada was really appreciative of those. And I think that's really stuck out on that morning walk. So as I was in New York, I think it was 1974, and I began, uh, part of my service was colleges and schools and so on. And, and there was one very favorable professor at Fordham University who had this idea to do a course on the Bhagavad Gita for credit. So, but he wanted me to teach the course. He, he had some other courses he did on Hinduism or whatever, and he used to bring students to the temple. So he had this idea, let's do this course on Bhagavad Gita. You teach it, but it will be officially my course so that students get credit for it. So I did this course, and uh, I used to go in a, in a suit. <laughs> and then I wrote to Srila Prabhupada about it. And he wrote me back, and it's the one letter which I, I received from Prabhupada that really I treasure. But the lesson in it was I had explained the whole system, what, what, how I did this. That, uh, and he said, you should make a newsletter. You should inform all the centers and, and that they can try to do the same thing. You know, find a favorable professor who can give credit, and you teach the course, but the students get credit. And, but the, the other message was that uh, if we can, somehow or other, if we can package Krishna consciousness in new ways, using the same content, like old wine in a new bottle, that is, uh, can be successful preaching. So that, that instruction has been one of my guiding lights in whatever I've tried to do. So we went to Sweden, and we um, all went on the ferry, and we went to the temple where Vegavan and Pamavati were taking care of it. And Prabhupada gave lots of classes. So I just recently found out that there was a lot of photos of me in those particular temple. But the highlight of that trip was when Prabhupada went to the Uppsala University. And there was a hippie there. And Prabhupada was talking about first class men, second class men, third class men, fourth class men. And the hippie stood up and he goes, and you, what class are you? And Prabhupada put his head down and he said, I am fifth class man. And it, wow, it was just so amazing. Prabhupada was just so humble. And that man just immediately sat down and never said a thing after that. Because that's our Shira Prabhupada, he was the most humble. You know, so that had an amazing impact on me too as well. I'd been reading uh, somewhat from the uh, books and realized how Prabhupada had quoted Chanakya Pandit many times. And on the morning walk sometimes in London in the park, Prabhupada would sometimes quote Chanakya. And I asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, are these instructions from Chanakya Pandit spiritual instructions? And Prabhupada looked quizzically and said, no, they're moral instructions, which was a very big eye-opener because on reflection it became very clear 
that Prabhupada had to teach us a whole lot about morality as well as spiritual life. So that was, uh, that was a big learning curve, always with Srila Prabhupada. It was such a nice learning curve. Once again, I see, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking a lot of these incidences where Prabhupada thinks about his uh, God disciples, female disciples a lot because, you know, over the years the God sisters have been, you know, somewhat um, not considered very nicely. But Prabhupada really loved his, his daughters. And he, um, I, I had, Prabhupada had a cold and Harisori had given me a little scrap of orange silk to make into a handkerchief for Prabhupada. I didn't sew it very well. I was very, you know, neophyte devotee. I was sewing for Radha Madhava. I thought, oh, I have to sew very quickly. So I had this little scrap of silk and I sewed it not very neatly, but gave it to Harisori. And then Harisori came to, uh, he, and, and incidentally, he had given me back that handkerchief after a little time. So I, I still have that handkerchief. And two years ago, I saw Hari Sori, and I said, Prabhu, do you remember that little orange handkerchief you gave me to sew for Prabhupada, that little scrap of silk? He said, oh, yes. I said, did Prabhupada actually ever use it? He said, oh, yeah, Prabhupada used it. He loved that handkerchief. And I went, really? I said, it, it was so horribly sewn. I feel, you know, 43 years later, I've, I still lament that I, I sewed it so poorly. And he said, look, I'll tell you what happened. He said, there were a lot of sannyasis in the room and I came in with this handkerchief to give to Prabhupada. And one of the sannyasis, and I won't mention who it was, but he was a high profile sannyasi, was telling Srila Prabhupada what an excellent sannyasi he was. I don't talk to women, I don't look at woman, women, I'm, I'm very fixed in my sannyas vows, and, you know, which is true. And Srila Prabhupada was just, was just looking down. And often Prabhupada would give enough rope to hang yourself. So he was just quietly listening, not commenting. And then Harisori handed this handkerchief that I had made. And Harisori told me that Prabhupada smiled, he beamed, and he picked up the handkerchief and he addressed the sannyasis in the room. He said, and I will always accept service from my daughters. So he was very concerned about that. Another very significant day was the Tamal Krishna Goswami being uh, sent to China. Uh, we consider that very significant because there's now a thousand devotees in China. We have about a hundred of them here that came for Gaur Purnima. But at the time, it was just like as if he was being banished. And uh, we didn't, you know, the Radha party had built up very successfully. And a lot of devotees were from temples that wanted to be with the sannyasis and they left their temples that were run by grahastras and those grahastras band together and came to complain to Srila Prabhupada, you know, we've, they've lost all these men to the Radha party. And Prabhupada, he really loved the Radha party and he could have said, well, to, I, I, I'm happy that they're there because he was. You know, and they're doing great work, and I, he could have stuck up for Tamal Krishna Goswami. He said, you know, he's, don't leave him alone, he's, he's my, but Prabhupada was very intuitive, and he understood that these dev devotees who were complaining had to be pacified. Prabhupada had to take their side because they would not have been able to handle it if he hadn't, and Tamal Krishna Maharaj was ready to do anything Prabhupada would tell him to do. He was fully surrendered. So Srila Prabhupada uh, called Goswami into the room and there was a conversation and Prabhupada said, uh, so what are we going to do with you, you know? And Tamal Krishnamara said, well, Prabhupada, maybe I should just go to China. And Prabhupada said, yes, <laughs> Krishna is speaking through you. And there was the whole exchange where Goswamis tried to get out of it, you know, well, Prabhupada, I can't, I was just joking, I, you know, and Prabhupada said, this is no joke, you're going to China, and uh, Guru Kripa said, well, Prabhupada, I'll, I'll go, and then Prabhupada said, no, he must go, and Prabhupada just wouldn't take no for an answer, and then uh, Tamal Krishna Maharaj relented, and then uh, we got, uh, so that was, that was right after Mangal Arti. 
So then Prabhupada packed it up and went out in the morning walk. And Hari Sari was Prabhupada's secretary, you know, and he would help Prabhupada, you know, the, the one motion thing of handing him this, his cane and his, and his uh, bead bag and as Prabhupada went out the door and then I had to have the tape recorder. And we went up to the Lotus Building, onto the roof. Pancharatna was there trying to stop people like me from getting on, and so I huddled in between Madhavisha and Keshava and I slipped in on this walk. And we got up onto the roof of the Lotus Building and Prabhupada turned around and was walking backwards. And he faced the sannyasi and GBC men and he raised his, put his hands out like this. He had his uh, cane and his beads. And he said, you'll all be happy to know, Tamal is going to China. And there was kind of a muffled uh, jai because it was sort of like the, the clap at a golf course in a tournament. It was very, it was like, uh, we didn't really want that to happen, you know, because it sounded like, exile. It, we had no idea that it was going to turn into him actually being able to do this. But it showed us that Prabhupada really cared about that part of the world. That's what I learned from that, that Prabhupada, under, you know, Prabhupada knew that China has to be uh, included in the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And it's going to take Tamal Krishna Goswami to make that happen. And he finally did. So that was the lesson I got from that. Prabhupada wanted, because this point, Prabhupada himself had gone to Russia and the rest of the world, Africa and Australia and America, north and south. So then China was still untapped. You know? So that, that was Prabhupada sending Goswami to China. In 1975, I was sent to Hong Kong to be the president there, and I began working with a translator, Prabhupada's first Chinese body disciple, Yasumati Sutta Prabhu. And he was working on the Bhagavad Gita as it is, and in, in 76 he had finally finished the first six chapters. So somehow or other, I arranged, we arranged, I arranged to, pre, to print this. And I sent a copy to Srila Prabhupada, and um, Srila Prabhupada was, was ecstatic, ecstatic. It was only the first six chapters, but it was his Bhagavad Gita as it is in his purports. So he, he wrote a letter to me, and he said, this is a great victory. This printing Bhagavad Gita as it is in Chinese, this will bring about the fall of communism in China. And this was in 1976. Well, today, you can see, it has happened. It may still be a dictatorship, but it's, there's no communism left. Uh, Prabhupada was very, was so ecstatic and excited about the, the, the printing of the Bhagavad Gita that several Swamis immediately wanted to come and distribute that book. Um, uh, Sridhar Maharaj came, uh, Trivikar Maharaj came. I had only printed 700 copies the first printing because it was expensive. But then immediately Prabhupada wrote me again, he says, reprint 5,000 copies and um, of that uh, it happened that Srivikram Swami and Srivikram Swami came to distribute until they were kicked out of Taiwan. Um, went to, they they took, to, took them to Taiwan to distribute. But Srila Prabhupada gave me some personal instructions about the China mission and, and the result of that Bhagavad Gita. Um, he told me, first of all, now you see to it that the preaching in Chinese and the printing in Chinese goes on. And also always set a good, ex uh, a, a high example, good example for the younger devotees. So that locked me into the China mission for a long time, 35 years. Um, and now we have so many books, we have so many Chinese devotees um, in Taiwan, in mainland China, anywhere there are Chinese devotees. We're, we're up in, we have multi volumes of Srimad Bhagavatam in Chinese. But uh, Yasumani Sutta's service should not be 
forgotten. He was authorized by Srila Prabhupada to be his translator for Chinese books. And, um, and even today, I'm told by the Chinese B China BBT that we find that the vocabulary he used and the translation that he did is the finest thing we have. One time in Bhaktivedanta Manor also, Prabhupada had called all the devotees, or so many devotees, to come into his personal room. And we didn't really know why, <laughs> but when we got there, I remember very clearly that it was a Sunday morning, in sort of mid-morning. And I remember it very distinctly because on a Sunday in those days, we didn't serve prasadam until mid-afternoon and I was really hungry. So we sat down in Prabhupada's room and Prabhupada was talking about going to India, that we should all go to India because apparently the American devotees had been having some difficulties and Prabhupada wanted some British devotees to go. So I remember feeling that hunger and Prabhupada, he called his servant to bring over a bowl of fruit. It was a small bowl of fruit with some grapes and one or two things on it. And while Prabhupada was talking to us, he just was running his left hand over the fruit. And then he motioned to his servant to give everyone a plate and give everyone a little fruit. And I remember they had this little plate with about three or four grapes on it. And I remember thinking, this isn't going to do it. <laughs> So, anyway, I gratefully ate the grapes and um, we concluded our meeting with Srila Prabhupada. But then afterwards, when we went out of his room, I realized that I wasn't in the least bit hungry anymore. And it was a very extraordinary experience because what happened, even when it came to time for the Sunday feast, I realized I still wasn't in the least bit hungry. But I took prasadam anyway, because I thought, well, I, I ought to eat. But it was, it was such an extraordinary experience how Prabhupada just almost nonchalantly, while we were talking, just rubbed his, just ran his fingers over the plate of fruit and then distributed it to us. It was, it was a very extraordinary and wonderful experience with Prabhupada. This story, shows me and I and, and I'm I'm very convinced of the fact that Prabhupada knew our hearts and so many pastimes that his disciples had that Prabhupada knew exactly what you were thinking. And I had seen this very beautifully embroidered embroidered cartel bag of the six Goswamis that someone had given Prabhupada. And I thought, this is so beautiful. I want to make something as nice as that and give it to Prabhupada. And my hidden agenda was Prabhupada will notice me. He'll say, oh, he has made this. Someone will say, oh, Krishna Rupa made it. Oh, very nice. And then, you know, I feel like my life has been successful. So I had a, my little strategy and I was learning Jari at the time. So before I'd start sewing for Radha Madhava, I'd spend half an hour every day embroidering this cartel bag for Prabhupada. So it was finally complete. And I said to Shruti Rupa, Shruti Rupa, because she was still cooking for Prabhupada at, at, with, I think, Palika. And I said, Sri Rupa, can you give this to Prabhupada for me? And she said, no, 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 you give it to him. I went, no way, I'm not giving this to Prabhupada. She said, okay, come with me and we'll give it to Prabhupada together. So Srila Prabhupada was sitting on a little asana, a little mini Vyasasan, outside on the marble corridor, um, on the other side of his uh, quarters. And so, you know, in my usual modus operandi, I was hiding behind Sri Rupa. So she had this, this thing, and I'm thinking, yes. And then Prabhupada would say, oh, this is very nice. Who has made this? And then she'll say, Krishna Rupa. And then I'll stick my head out beside Sridhi Rupa. And Prabhupada will say, oh, thank you very much. This is very nice. This was a scenario that was playing around in my head. So of course it didn't happen like that, because Prabhupada knew what my, you know, I was motivated. And she handed the gift to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada picked it up like it was I don't know what. And he picked it up and looked at it and went to, looked at her and said, what is this? 
<laughs> Internally, I was laughing my head off. I thought, oh, thank you, Prabhupada. You've really given me a very good lesson here. <laughs> but the little orange handkerchief thing made up, made up for that. 1975, all, lots of devotees came from all over the world for the Mayapur festival and Prabhupada was here in Mayapur with us and then after that we went to Hyderabad and when we were in Hyderabad I got the opportunity to go with Srila Prabhupada out to the land that we'd been do donated, 100 acres. I think there was two cars of devotees and I happened to be able to go and we were proper walking around looking at the land and we got to go for a swim in the in the Pukur and then we had the Shadam and then Prabhupada took a rest and we took a rest in the room next door and then he came out and he was talking to us and afterwards everyone said oh Srila Prabhupada was looking right at me and he was speaking to me and I said yes he did he did that to me too. And it was about three or four devotees and every one of them thought Srila Prabhupada was speaking directly to them. So that was what he was like. He was just so personal. And he really loved us. He really cared for us. He really gave us so much attention, you know, even if it was only just a small little bit of attention. He knew that meant a lot to us. So much so that for the rest of our lives we never forgot. No, so that was our Srila Prabhupada, the most merciful and kind and loving person. I'd like to say a little more about Mayapur, 1976. Just uh, one thing Prabhupada said on the, mor on the morning walk that showed how much he cared about Mayapur was uh, he said we should close down everything we're doing all over the world and just bring all the devotees here to Mayapur and develop this place. He'd have been already talking about the, te the Temple of the Vedic Planetarium, and now he made this extraordinary statement. So in Rameshwar song, he said, But Prabhupada, we have so many preaching programs going on all over the world. And Prabhupada said, We'll preach to people here. We'll bring them, people will come from all over and to Mayapur, and, and when they get here, then we'll preach to them. And then he pointed out to over here where this, uh, kind of a field out by the Jalangi behind the Goshal area and he said we'll build an airport and people will come from all over the world. I, um, I wanted to have that confirmed so I, I confronted Rameshwar just about a month ago when he was here in Mayapur. I said do you remember when Prabhupada said that everything should be brought here to Mayapur and you said, you know, we have all these other preaching programs and, and I, I got him to admit it. He goes, yes, Prabhupada did say that, something like that, but he didn't really mean to close down everything. He, so we, we agreed that he was just trying to show the importance of Mayapur. Uh, that, that was what I learned from that, that Prabhupada, Mayapur meant very, very much to Srila Prabhupada. One time he told Giriraj Swami that book distribution in Mayapur are my most important projects. Another uh, event that happened that also showed me that Prabhupada, you know, his, his attention to his disciples was very deep and very great. And even to, you know, little Ramacharinis. And I, um, this was, must have been, I think, in 1977. And Prabhupada was unwell beginning of 77 so he was not he spent two months actually in Mayapur so either 76 or 77 and every day at 4 p.m. we would go into his room and we would have darshan for two hours yeah 4 30 till 7 and Prabhupada would either talk or he would just chant and we were very happy just to you know be in the same room as Srila Prabhupada we in fact I'm sure each devotee in that room was praying that, you know, let the night be, let that time be like Lord Brahma's, you know, day and night. It was so wonderful being there. And um, this one time, I was a little bit late. 
my service had extended a little bit late and I didn't make it in time. And I always sat in this one particular spot. And I came rushing up to Prabhupada's room. The fly screen was closed, but the door was open. And much to my dismay, I could see that the room was crowded and my spot was taken and the room was crowded. And I must have had such a devastated look on my face. And then Prabhupada noticed me. And with just a very elegant movement of his head, he indicated that I should come around to the other side because it had two entrance ways. So I went pelting around the other side. And it was still quite crowded there. And when I got to the doorway, Sri Prabhupada just gestured with his hand for the devotees to move and make room for me. So even though, you know, such a, a teeny weeny little devotee, Prabhupada, noticed us all and was very considerate and, you know, he could see that uh, I had been, you know, really disappointed that I wouldn't be able to fit in that room. So he made sure that I could fit in that room. And another incident that occurred in his room, too, and I, I know I have to stop. One was Prabhupada would always have a jar of gore balls, which were coconut and gore, and they would be handed out to dignitaries. He had, in this particular incident, he had a group of his god brothers come to visit him. And I won't tell the devotee's name, I know who it was, but his job was to hand out the, these prashada sweet balls to the guests as they were leaving. He got the big jar, opened it up, put his left hand in and handed it with his left hand to Prabhupada's god brother. Prabhupada was embarrassed and he said to his god brothers, please excuse my Malecha disciples. They don't know. And of course, this poor devotee actually, I think, was left-handed. So, you know, it was very embarrassing. Prabhupada apologized. And again, the devotee put his hand in with his left hand and handed out <laughs> another, to another god brother with his left hand. By this stage, Prabhupada was, was annoyed. So one has to be very careful. Always give with your right hand and accept with your right hand, <laughs> no matter whether you're ambidextrous or not. And um, referring to Prabhupada's god brothers, there was another incident there where one devotee had just arrived from America and he was sitting there and he, his F, he was trying to praise Srila Prabhupada. But by praising Srila Prabhupada, he was doing this by negating Prabhupada's god brothers. And in Maipur, we were all very clear about the relationship with Prabhupada and his god brothers. We, we understood very clearly what Prabhupada wanted us to do in relationship with this. And this devotee started to somewhat denigrate Prabhupada's god brothers in trying to praise Prabhupada. And so he's saying, oh, Prabhupada, you know, you've, you've done so much. Your god brothers did this, your god brothers didn't do that. And all of a sudden you could feel this, this it was palpable, this displeasure. And we're all sitting there in the room thinking, oh, Mother Bhumi, please open up a hole in that floor so that poor Brahmachari can just disappear because he's really displeased Prabhupada. And Prabhupada was silent for a good, you know, 50, 60 seconds. It felt longer. And he was looking down. And then he looked, raised his head and looked at this boy. And he said, I can criticize my god brothers, but you cannot. So that was a very valuable lesson that we understand what's the, the history and we understand what's the story, but we should always be respectful to all Vaishnavas. And Prabhupada exemplified that so perfectly. I was cooking and I made this para. Para is a burfi where you cook it down until it becomes like a cookie. And I was making all the milk sweets for Radha Govinda, trained by Bhakti Vinod Prabhu. And this, the servant came down and said, Prabhupada said that to tell the cook that the para was very good. So that really touched my heart, you know. Prabhupada, he was so personal. I realized how personal Srila Prabhupada was. He was thinking about that somebody's cooking these milk sweets and that they should know that they did something right. And he told the, the secretary to tell me you know, that's how personal Prabhupada was. There was everything going on, but he was able to appreciate a little milk sweet sitting on his breakfast plate, along with everything else. He really paid attention to detail. And then we had a, a darshan, 
with uh, Irmela and her husband and the baby and her father. Now, Irmela wasn't real happy that a bunch of devotees were allowed in the room, but I was really happy that we got to go to this darshan because it was so nice to be with Sri Prabhupada up there on the 11th floor of the, of the skyscraper building in, on 55th Street. And Sri Prabhupada, he's, he was saying how uh, people are afraid of death, you know, so then they, they go, uh, why, the, why, he said, why, if we're not afraid to die, why do we fly? So why do we run away when, there, when there's danger? If there's a, the building's on fire, why, why do they avoid a building and then call the fire department? Then Prabhupada made the noise of wah, 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 you know, about <laughs> the sound of the fire engine going by. And he said that there's always, these, these vehicles are always making this, the, the noise, you know, from the sirens, so emergency vehicles. So Prabhupada was, I learned that Prabhupada was trying to show that we are definitely afraid of death. Why do we always try to avoid it all? If anybody says we're not afraid of death, they're not really being honest. Prabhupada knew that, yeah, everybody's afraid of death. Nobody wants that. So then, unless you're suicidal, you know, but that's only, that's because you're afraid of living. But that doesn't mean that you're not afraid. Everyone's afraid, you know. So there was a, Nice discussion with the father. The father, he said to Srila Prabhupada, it was also nice how Pra I learned that Prabhupada liked devotees' parents to be able to feel comfortable. He he would uh, reach out, you know, to he knew that he had so many all these the kids became his kids. <laughs> and he was trying to show that Prabhupada was the father, but it, he was he was also very appreciative of anybody who brought their parents, you know. So, Irma's father said to Prabhupada, I can't relate to serving God. I can only relate to serving humanity. So, Sri Prabhupada said, when you serve God, then you, then you can serve humanity. He said, if you love God, you can love everyone else. He used the example of a pond. He said, if you throw rocks in the middle of the pond, then the little rivulets, they expand outward more and more but there's no conflict as long as the rocks are in the center of the pond. He said if there's different interests, then there's always conflict. If you have stones dropping, he used the word stone, if you have stones dropping in different places. He said, but as long as they're in the center, then as long as you put your love to Krishna, love to God in the center, then it expands evenly until again it reaches the lotus feet of God. In 1977, early in the year, uh, around Gaur Purnima time, uh, the devotees came to Bombay and Prabhupada came there. And Prabhupada was really not well at all. It was a very difficult time. I remember he wanted to stay in his rooms, but the devotees said that his rooms are not ready. And Prabhupada replied, if they're not ready now, they'll never be ready. So they pulled out all the stops. They put out carpets and probably cleared up, covered up all the bits of concrete and uh, metal sticking out the walls. And they carried Prabhupada up and down on his palanquin. Um, and Prabhupada came down onto the it was like a platform. That was all there was of the temple, really, at that time. And Prabhupada sat there, and we all sat below the platform, and we had Guru Puja for Srila Prabhupada. Now, after the Guru Puja, Prabhupada, uh, you know, we sing the song, Sri Guru Charana Padma, and it's always a nice meditation on the words. But Prabhupada asked, what is the gift of the spiritual master? And I remember I tried to answer something. I don't remember exactly what I said. But what Prabhupada said was very interesting. He said, it is Dibyagyan. He said that it is transcendental knowledge. Don't think that what the spiritual master is giving you is material knowledge. He is giving you transcendental knowledge. And then he said, if you always remember this, 
you will always be able to feel obliged to your spiritual master. And that's something which has stayed with me all these years, very much how to feel obliged to Prabhupada and try to discharge that obligation to him. I have never seen a person like Srila Prabhupada in my life so humble. Whatever credit he did, he did gave it to his Guru Maharaj. And that's why I loved his concluding words of Chaitanya Charitamrita, which some or other was not translated into Hindi till last year. As he said, there are two way of association, Vani and Bopu. So I still have the feeling that Srila Prabhupada is guiding me like anything, and he's fulfilling, his, I'm not qualified to receive his mercy. But he is still, he was so humble and uh, so affectionate. We have seen our mundane, actually he met my parents and he said, give your son to me in Vrindavan. Father said, it's already yours, utilize him. So Prabhupada's mercy, his affection, I mean, after his disappearance, it's true, Vani and Bapu are same, but somehow or other, we are not able to console ourselves. Now nobody is there to chastise and nobody is there to guide and love. So that is his humbleness and his eternal affection for us, which we'll enjoy. And we pray to him, somehow to engage in his service, not in this, but maybe wherever he's preaching, if we could assist him. That's perfection of life, because as he says in his poem, if you want to Guru Sevai Vastu Mile, Jivane Sarthak Jadi Hoy, his Bengali poem. He's saying that the only perfection of life is to serve Guru. And he had the confidence, he hadn't reached states, but he said that Prativite Nagaradi, Ashamudra Nadanadi, Shakalai Lai Krishna Nam. Every town and village will chant the name of Krishna. This was his realization, his uh, faith in his, his Guru Maharaj, that before reaching America, he's predicting like that. He says, Say some Mahant Guru. So I made Shri Shrimad Bhakti Vedanta, Nanda Sutta, Priyatyant, he's very loving to Krishna. And he's unparalleled, Guru Sevai Jartulya Nai, who is unparalleled in service to his spiritual master. And he's also a great Acharya who is not only giving Krishna Bhakti, he's giving God Krishna, Chaitanya as well Krishna. Srila Prabhupada was always trying to engage us no matter what, even though we made mistakes. I can remember so many times when I was trying to escort Srila Prabhupada to the bathroom after he'd given a fiery lecture on the fifth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. We were petrified. He was roaring like a lion. He was saying things that could have got him and us in jail that night. <laughs> he was so uncompromising. He was fierce. He was like, he, nobody could stop Srila Prabhupada because he knew he knew how to be revolutionary according to time, place, and circumstance. Whereas we were like fanatical. You know, Prabhupada absolutely knew how to, how to engage a revolution in consciousness. He knew how to do it. And one time after the lecture, you know, like a fool, I wanted to take him off the stage through the audience, the long way around the foyer, so he could see the book distribution that I was setting up. People were buying the books like anything. He saw that and he said, oh, we're selling so many books. And he was impressed. And then we got to the bathroom the long way around and he said, but, oh, the bathroom. But all the time when he was on the stage, he was telling me the bathroom's there on the, and the wings of the stage. So I was like a fool trying to get, you know, trying to treat him like a servant. You know? <laughs> so still he didn't, chastised me, he was humble enough, you know, to follow me and come the long way around and see the books, which I wanted him to see, but I put pressure on him, he wanted to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I felt like a right idiot. <laughs> In my relationship, his gravity was prominent. Uh, I've no, you, you saw, you know, a few, there, there were a few times that I interacted where there was gravity in his demeanor. Uh, and I, that, that 
that's stayed with me, I think, the most, that his, his seriousness about the mission of Krishna consciousness, it was, it was everything. You know, and, and, and everything, nothing trivial. There was nothing. I, there was nothing trivial to Srila Prabhupada. He could be humorous. He could he could uh, take things lightly. But even when he took things lightly, it, they weren't trivial. He did everything was meaningful. There was meaning in everything. In in the way he held his hands, there was meaning. The way he looked at you, there was there was meaning in everything. And that's, uh, I think, what's stuck with me, especially. My service now is that I like to look after the devotees. And somehow or other, I've imbibed some of those qualities from Srila Prabhupada, that to be loving, caring, um, interested in them as a person, making sure that their health is good, and Prabhupada used to always say that. If he, one time he seen one Madhichi and it was a cool morning and she didn't have a chadar on or a jumper on and Prabhupada said, uh, aren't you cold? And she said, no, but she told the temple president, you must make sure all the devotees have warm clothing. Whatever they need, you must make sure they have that. And so I've never met a person in my life that really went out of their way to look at every little aspect like that. But, and Srila Prabhupada was like that. He always wanted to know if we were in good health. If the devotees were sick, he'd tell the temple president, you make sure they have the medicine they need and that. And with the stories that I've told, I feel like you can see the love that Srila Prabhupada had for us. He really genuinely cared for us. And I think he was just that type of person naturally, but also he, he imbibed a bit of that from back to Siddhartha Saraswati too as well, who was, was very caring to Srila Prabhupada and the stories that we've heard. So, you know, that, that he came to the West and all the devotees came and helped him to spread this Hare Krishna movement. And he never forgot, he never forgot that that meant a lot to him. He said one time that um, the devotees were saying, how can you say that we were sent to you when we were meat eaters, you know, womanizers, whatever we were before, drug takers. Prabhupada said, that was all superficial. As soon as you heard the chanting of the Mahamantra, you came running. So he, everything, every, he was just so personal. And when I read his books, when I hear his classes, it's all there. And so I, I like to imbibe those qualities, what Srila Prabhupada had, and that's how I try to treat the devotees. And I'm finding that they do notice it. They notice it a lot. And I think that if we really want this Hare Krishna movement to go powerful ahead, then we have to get some of those qualities. Because even out in the material world, people aren't personal anymore. They don't care. And so I even have a nice relationship with the non-devotees in that way, that they see that I care about people. So and that was Srila Prabhupada. He would rem One thing I can't do what Srila Prabhupada did was I can't remember names like he did. He would meet someone five years before and he could still remember their name. I, I find the best way for me is a name, and I relate like your name back to Sir and to Saraswati, so I remember your name. So in that way. So Parapab was really expert. So if we can just imbibe a few of those qualities, if not all of those nice qualities Srila Prabhupada had, I'm so sure we can spread this movement much better than what we are now not only just um, bringing people to Krishna consciousness, but taking care of the ones that we already have. I think that's so important. And people look at us and they watch us and we're totally sometimes unaware of that, but I'm becoming more and more aware of how the public sees us. That's why I try to teach the devotees 
to be nice Vaishnavas and Vaishnavis and be a representative of Srila Prabhupada in all ways. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada himself told us that he had the mind of a British officer and the heart of a Bengali mother. That means he was deeply intelligent and analytical and perceptive before we even began talking about Supersoul, he could talk to Krishna. And he was also deeply compassionate. There was no limit to Srila Prabhupada's compassion. If devotees was, uh, fell down or was having difficulties in, of any type, uh, Srila Prabhupada was always trying to help and always wa willing to take back. The devotee welcomed them back. If, if, if you were penitent and you're humble and you're, you're sorry, then he, he, they were welcomed back. So I think it was a good lesson to be learned that in this day and age where um, for some reason or other this idea of banning has come about, uh, it didn't come from Prabhupada, I'll tell you that right now. Um, he warned one, he warned two devotees, I, w I shouldn't remember their, na I shouldn't quote, say their names, but one devotee he warned and the devotee left and did his own thing. And Prabhupada said, well, he has left and done his own thing. What can I do? Um, and then later on, he came back and Srila Prabhupada welcomed him in the, in the family again. It happened with another devotee that you were acting crazy and, and uh, committing so many offenses and you, you should stop dealing with devotees like this. And, and as soon as the devotee was uh, apologetic and humble, submissive, and he was welcomed back into the family. There's no such thing as a lifelong banding or whatever. Well, there's one thing that really struck me, and this happened after Prabhupada had left. And I was sitting in Vishnumurti's Back to Vedanta Archives office in, near Watford one time. And I happened to be listening to a tape that was playing there. And I heard this really extraordinary thing that just I'd never really come across in the course of ordinary dealings with the mass of devotees because I never really had any one-to-one -one time with Prabhupada. But Prabhupada was having a discussion clearly with some devotees and one devotee was talking about Shamsunda Prabhu, who was our former GBC and who was Prabhupada's secretary for a long time. And he'd mentioned that, oh, Shamsunda is doing this and doing that and doing the other. And it was a bit uh, disappointing to hear what had happened to him. But then Prabhupada said, actually, he was the best servant I ever had. And that genuine appreciation from Srila Prabhupada just really struck me that Prabhupada really had so much affection for his devotees. And that was something that in all the years in ISKCON, it was almost something that had been lost in the translation of what we'd learned. But then hearing that from Prabhupada made a, a huge impact on me that Prabhupada had so much genuine caring and love uh, and warmth for the devotees and real compassion and that would hopefully be our ticket back home. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Jai Ani